Hi, my name is Dennis. Welcome to Foundations AWS Migration Practices and Architectures. Let's go ahead and get started. Our learning objectives today include understanding appropriate migration and deployment strategies to different applications and workload environments. We also want to be able to architect common application best practice patterns from post-migration state, right? What's your final state for production, um, even from a different production source? And finally, we'll also learn how to migrate on-premise hosts or simulate the effect of that inside to your AWS EC2 instances from different VPCs. Right, so let's talk a little bit more about enterprise architecture review. If you look at different content modules before, we also wanna note that there's different monolithic needs, containers, uh, infrastructure as a service uh, based on virtualizations, and finally, full serverless. Let's see how those all play and what the advantages are to each and uh, possibly what you need to reconsider when you're migrating things to AWS itself. First and foremost, we had the premise of actually on-premise bare metal and VMs, right? Those are things that you use for Ubuntu, for Linux foundations, um, things that you possibly use on your home computer. Ultimately, you have a single hardware resource that could be better utilized itself. So you had a a very logically um, dense hardware with multiple CPUs, lots of RAM. Maybe you don't want to run everything on three sets of them. Maybe you only want to run it on one and to maximize your current utilization and workload uh, for what you paid for from a hardware standpoint. And that's basic virtualization at its best. You were doing so in EC2 instances all this time by launching EC2 instances as virtual machines inside a hypervisor that AWS owns, manages, and operates. So on demand, they give you CPUs and memory. You don't have to specify anything else. You just specify what you need as a demand. What the on-premise one looks like, if you were to manage it yourself, would be VMware or vSphere for a workstation. Remember that you're sharing the hardware OS. I mean, you're sharing the hardware, but not the OS. And you want to go from a single workload for one-to-one -one for each hardware to multiple workloads, multiple operating systems for each hardware. Remember, ultimately, at the end of the day, you still have to manage you still have to manage the underlying hardware and operating systems as part of your shared responsibilities within AWS. Remember that you have responsibilities of data in the cloud. AWS has responsibilities of security of the cloud. Next up, you have containers. The containers extract another layer. Remember that containers can be in the form of Docker, Linux open container, or other container uh, standard types. You know, the most popular is Docker. Docker and other components in Amazon AWS ECS can actually run containers inside the VPC, inside the account. You do shared hardware, shared underlying operating systems, and potentially external libraries itself. There's another layer of extraction. You don't need to run a guest operating system like you do with traditional hypervisors, which is uh, right here where hypervisors type ones and type twos. You don't need to worry about that. What you do need to worry about is still how your application runs. So you have a Docker base image and you have containerized applications based on different runtimes. One could be Python, one, another one could be .NET. Now, ultimately, as long as they all run on, uh, run on the same host operating system, Docker will manage or your container platform will manage what you need from a dependency standpoint. So you still have to package up and install dependencies and make sure it runs in that environment, but you can actually make all the dependencies inside a container, hence making it more portable and readily easily used for API consumption, for instance. Now, to manage these containers, remember that we wanna decouple, we wanna go from monolithic architecture where it does every single thing under the sun, um, turnkey for the end user, but at the same time, if you're a developer, this is very difficult. If you're trying to make code changes in one aspect, you might break something else. So containers have a way of making sure that you have functional separation at the application runtime level. Now look how we do um, get virtualized deployments, traditional, traditional ones onward of extraction layers. When you go with containers, remember that you're specifying the runtime environment that the application must run. All the libraries, all the dependencies have to be containerized. And if you expose an API or a service through a port, such as 443, for instance, 
you might have multiple containers because you want to make sure that container doesn't die. Let's say you kill this container. What happens to your service? What happens to your function? And for that, we need container orchestration, and that would be Kubernetes deployment base. So Kubernetes is an open source, uh, freely available orchestration for containers such as Docker. And you can have them run multiple containers of the same type and allow it to expose the users for high availability or scaling. So if you have a high demand of your service, one container with uh, a, a limited CPU utilization, it's not going to cut it. You might have to run multiple containers to meet the needs of an exposure or a, a complete failure. Also, you might want them to run on different times uh, based on demand or based on particular um, use case needs. All those have to be considered and your max amount of compute time and resources have to be maximized. And so ultimately Kubernetes and other management services like it uh, will be able to help you orchestrate your containers. Now, Amazon has its own, which is EKS or Elastic Kubernetes Service, which is managed Kubernetes um, versus ECS, which is Elastic Container Service, which also is an orchestration service in itself. Um, and then of course you have KAS, which means Kubernetes itself. If you were to run it by yourself without any kind of managed service providing. So remember if you're running infrastructure to support other infrastructure, Perhaps it might be time to change your way of thinking or perhaps change the way you do DevOps. When you do DevOps and you're changing that way or you're trying to move toward a DevOps-based program, you have to understand that managing your own infrastructure to manage other infrastructure seems a little redundant. So leveraging cloud managed services could help you with that. Or if you need it for compliance purposes or internal needs and you can do so better, Perhaps an on-premise deployment and management of your Kubernetes clusters makes the most sense to you. Now, the way everything else is, is ECS has the uh, items of, of definitions, task definitions, and you can run multiple containers within a task, which is uh, like a service. So multiple containers running under Docker would be a Kubernetes uh, on, on a node-based uh, cluster here. Now, ECS, Elastic Container Service, it's another orchestration-based tool. Orchestration being that if you have the container, it has an ability for you to store it somewhere, which is ECR, container registry, and ECS being the server itself, orchestrating those containers together. Here we see a bunch of tasks, at least particularly two tasks. We can have an EC2 instance running one container or multiple containers for task service type one. Um, you can also have tasks with a set of multiple containers, again, sizes, you can have them have a mix and match of containers running on uh, Amazon Fargate, Amazon EC2. Now, Fargate is a different launch type. Now, EC2, remember that anything EC2 is going to be launching EC2 in your VPC. So you're still in charge of patching, management, rebooting, uh, if necessary. If, if the task uh, from ECS is failing for whatever reason and it's not rebooting, you still have to manage the sizing of everything, and it just becomes a very uh, cumbersome item. Remember that you're trying to decouple your services and your needs from a monolithic structure and go to micro-based services, right? Containers are a way or separate, stepping evolution into microservices. AWS Fargate itself is a way for saying, I don't know what I, I don't want to manage the EC2 instances. You manage it. I tell you what the sizing you need and you determine based on strategies and the task uh, definition requirements, how many hosts I need, where you need to put different tasks and, and requests and responses on one or more containers of that task. That's all it really means. So AWS Fargate is the highest level of extraction when you're using ECS. Alternatively, you can use uh, EKS with Fargate so you don't have to manage the backend. You have a completely managed system. You don't have to worry about being locked into Amazon Web Service technology such as ECS. Um, if you decide to use EKS along with Fargate, or EKS along with EC2 instance, you can mix and match and determine based on your needs of your organization, uh, what kind of infrastructure, what kind of open source requirements, how much of that do you want managed outside versus in-house? Those are considerations you need to, need to take. But ultimately, if you have more than one container, you need to orchestrate it. That's all it really means, scheduling, running, resource allocation. And ultimately, do you want to worry about your own EC2 instances or would you rather have Fargate? worry about that for you. Remember that there's more money associated with more managed services, so please keep that in mind as you go forward. 
AWS EKS means managed Kubernetes. One of the most uh, common things that you might do with EKS is that you might have uh, worker nodes and you have them, and that's the equivalent of having a service uh, based on ECS tasks. So you can have EC2 or four gate-based hardware types that you have a launch type for. And it's the same premise. EKS is just using Kubernetes. It's just that we're managing it from an AWS standpoint for you. You have a server and you don't have to worry about managing infrastructure to manage your container-based infrastructure. So if you wanted to utilize the same technology used on-premise without having a context switch or a training switch, consider EKS first and utilize the Fargate type. It's kind of easier way in um, and then not have to worry about EC2 instances. That kind of gives you the best of both worlds, uh, along with potentially uh, putting things in front of load balancers for additional security and practices. Now, when we talk about factoring and refactoring, we want to talk about what is monolith? Well, monolith being an all-in-one application that you create that does logins, that does the logging, that does the database writing, you want that in a single application, and it's usually a very long time to develop. And it's even harder to migrate because they're not in pieces. Macroservices is where you can actually say, well, I'm gonna take a few of those APIs and put them into the cloud for testing and scale them up. And we're gonna take a few of those pieces outside of the monolithic architecture, what we think critical that could be cloud ready, um, and then leave the rest of it code remaining as is. And then finally, a microservice architecture is saying, hey, maybe it's time to refactor entirely. Refactoring means we are protecting essentially. We wanna say, ultimately, microservices need to run everything API. The more APIs we have, the more uh, decoupling that we have. If one API fails, it's not gonna bring down the entire application. If we make a change in one function or API that's highly robust, we're not too worried about it, right? That can be relying on containers or serverless, whatever your combination may be. We wanna to get to a point of microservices architecture, and that requires a significant amount of uh, re-architecture and thinking about how you do things. So instead of if, then, else from a singularity linear-based progression, you have a bit-based data architecture and data uh, configurations and leverage, and you wanna be able to manipulate that data based on events rather than linear requirements and synchronous uh, based items. So asynchronous means event-based and most driven architecture requirements, and you associate those with microservices. APIs, highly robust, resilient, high availability, easier to accomplish in smaller pieces versus trying to do everything in one knockout punch. And we talked a little bit about EC2 versus Fargate launch times. I want to visualize this for you because this is very hard for students. So scheduling and orchestration, right? The, ECS versus EKS, uh, both scheduling and orchestration, and both you can use Fargate launch types. With ECS and uh, EC2-based launch types, uh, management still has to occur. You have agent installed, you have an image installed, and things can go wrong. And ultimately, you still have to worry about the patching um, and, and the underlying operating system accordingly, along with security groups and all that stuff. So those, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Versus Fargate, it handles every single bit of that aspect of security requirements for you based on your task definition, right? A container can be multiple containers inside a task, uh, depending on your availability and resource requirements. Your task definition says what your task is to do, when it runs, how much resources it takes, um, what's the optimization strategy there, and Fargate will do that strategy for you as your launch type versus EC2 instances where you have to kind of still have to worry about what's in your VPC. Um, another layer of abstraction, remember you want to automate as much as possible, especially uh, the, the heavy lifting that occurs with infrastructure that you don't want to do. You want to focus on development and making sure your code is robust. Infrastructure should go to a managed services whenever possible. Now this full blown on serverless. Now, serverless comes into many factors here. Serverless can mean different things to many cloud providers, but from an Amazon Web Service standpoint, Serverless usually includes anything that requires no extraction at all related to infrastructure or even runtime. So for instance, we have AWS Lambda. You can have different runtimes like Python. As mentioned, Python, .NET, PowerShell, many other aspects, Node.js. These are all different runtimes run function as a service. So that's what AWS Lambda is about. You also have gateways, AWS Gateway, API Gateway, 
DynamoDB. Um, there's many different aspects. And if I can get my pin back up and running, I'm not sure what we went here. Let's go back to our environment and click accordingly and get my pin back here and draw. There we go. So DynamoDB is a serverless-based uh, a NoSQL uh, database platform where you don't manage anything. You just say what you need, or it can allow it to auto scale for you. API like Gateway. So many of these things, some of them you saw, which is uh, Cognito earlier, Route 53, these automatically scale horizontally for you based on your demand and your needs. You only specify what goes in, what comes out, and potentially what kind of resources you need. You don't even have to worry about the runtime environment. It gets set up for you based on your library and dependency needs and gets managed all for you. So really, you only have to focus on the code and the events that go in and out based on your logic flow and the diagram here. Here we have a, uh, we have uh, Amplify Console and Amazon Cognito authenticating mobile apps. And they might have Route 53 for DNS for maybe a website name, API name. Everything gets sent back to the API call. Uh, one or more lambdas will run functions based on your API call needs and write tables, write items to a Dynamo DB database. And look, we have no server-based infrastructure requirements whatsoever. Now remember that AWS Lambda and all these, um, and anything custom code-wise from an event standpoint, is still container-based technology underneath. You're just not managing the runtime portion of it anymore, unlike traditional container management. So full serverless basically means you focus on the code and you focus on what goes in and what comes out and scaling, uh, a good chunk of security, not everything, but a good chunk of security, um, as well as the different uh, aspects and configurations. You don't have to worry about those anymore. You just focus on what you do best, which is DevOps coding. And really, uh, again, uh, things like AWS Lambda, DynamoDB, Cognito, and Route 53, that's all portions of Amazon Web Service based serverless computing um, architectures. Let's take a quick break and then return back um, and learn a little bit more about our concepts and what we need to do in terms of aligning migration. I'll wait. Welcome back from our break. Hope you had a great one. Now it's time to determine what we do and how we migrate to AWS and what are some of the best practice patterns that go with it. Ultimately, you want to do the cloud adoption framework. So just like we had a well architect framework in previous modules, you want to also utilize cloud adoption framework. And for that aspect, we have to look at different uh, stakeholders from the business side. What's our return on investment? Right? Return on investment, rate of investment, our use case, what's our need, and our business case, you know, project management. We also under understand that we have to also talk about people. Is, are they ready? Do we have to get training for these people? Um, is there a culture shift mentality of becoming proactive at monitoring and operations? That has to be taken account for and who are the stakeholders with those um, items. We also have an idea of what governance looks like, change management controls, what kind of technologies are allowed, and what, what we need to consider from a, usually from an OGC standpoint, a privacy standpoint, and many other um, assessments of stakeholders inside that kind of pillar. We also have platform. Is what we have from a workflow standpoint licensed and ready for the cloud? How do we ship those licenses accordingly? Uh, for instance, Microsoft SQL Server is licensed based on CPU count and sometimes based on socket count. Now socket from a, um, from a standpoint, for those of you who have not built servers before, let's say I have four sockets, each of them could have eight CPU cores in each one. And while you could be charged for 32 uh, total CPU cores, you have four sockets and that licensing might change depending on your software type. Each socket contains a physical CPU that has eight cores each. So even though you have 32 cores, it's not on a single uh, socket or die there. You also have the idea of security. What kind of compliance requirements are there? Is Amazon Web Services for you from a compliance standpoint for XYZ services? Uh, for, perhaps if you're a healthcare entity, you might have HIPAA. And HIPAA has a security and a privacy rule is there a certification on all services that you're going to be using for your workloads or just some of them? If you have HIPAA compliance um, at certain services, you're good to go. If you don't, you might have to have compensating controls and you have to think about the security aspect of when you migrate things to cloud because the technology stack changes. And ultimately operations, are we ready to produce 
things in the cloud much quicker? Are we able to get results quicker? What is our, are we able to monitor? What are our KPIs for not just the migration, but what happens afterwards? Our long-term care and feeding of our workloads accordingly. Now, in the CAF, or the Cloud Adoption Framework, we have the idea of ethics and stories. Each of these pillars right here, agility, operational resilience, cost avoidance, uh, productivity, and operational costs, really is the ethics within our Cloud Adoption Framework. Our stories are things like our use cases. We want to do certain things. And the story comes from multiple different stakeholders and aspects. Uh, we want to say, well, we focus on cost in one aspect. We want to do DevOps and practice in another aspect, such as operational workforce pro productivity. We want to decommission and retire applications we no longer need. And so we want to make that plan of action, that strategy of what our case is, so we can understand what our investment how long it might take for our savings and how long-term we want to be with this adoption of the cloud. Next, when you have that strategy together, you want to also have a plan of action. These actions come in the form of these different lenses right here, and you usually have these in terms of workshops. And you develop stories, or you develop uh, mostly stories that eventually get to backlog tasks. What do you want to accomplish from a business lens standpoint? What do you want to accomplish from a people standpoint, governance, security, operations, and platform? What has to happen? And so you might have multiple tiles here for each of these flows. Um, consider these different swim lanes based on the lenses or the point of view from the stakeholders in each major pillar. Now, in terms of migration strategy, once you have determined that Amazon Web Services is right for you from a migration standpoint or any other cloud for that matter, you have to understand that there's main principles. At Amazon Web Services, the principles include rehost, which is saying lift and shift. We have replatform, which means, hey, I need a lift, tinker, and shift, which means I might say I have Microsoft SQL Server, but maybe I can migrate it to a MySQL RDS instance so I can not have to worry about the infrastructure for database backend, but still have the uh, majority of my architecture intact. I have refactor, which means completely we are protecting everything I do, going from monolithic to container, or perhaps container to serverless pool, or maybe a step-by-step -step phase in approach at a certain amount of time. There's also repurchase. So at the end of the day, I might have to repurchase some aspects, some software, or consider a completely different stack altogether that still fits the same need uh, to help me keep my architecture together without refactoring. We also can think about retiring. So if I don't need the application workload anymore and we can uh, have it replaced by some other process or workload need for or a highly robust microservice somewhere, uh, somewhere else which someone else already created, then don't do so. Don't move junk into the cloud. Garbage in, garbage out. And finally, retain. Retain and revisit usually means, well, maybe cloud is not for me yet because there's too much work involved, too much cost, and not enough return on investment within the first fiscal year. You have to keep that in mind when you're working with corporations that there's a limited time that you have to get projects complete from A to Z. This timeline of a what your path looks like, depending on your six R's of migration strategies, um, really depends. Now, most of the time, the fastest way to get here is repost and replatform, which is um, lifting and shifting and maybe tinkering with some of them in some cases. Among the longest uh, lead times for all of this is the delineation of refactoring, repurchasing, um, together, and of course you have retain and retire, being uh, mostly retain, taking the longest portion to get to the cloud and leverage some of the best scaling and best practices among them. So uh, Amazon Cognito is a portion of that strategy, please ignore that. But remember that Amazon Cognito provides authentication. And if you're looking at migration strategies and it may include Amazon Cognito with it, that could be part of your, honestly, your replatforming and refactoring portions of it. Not necessarily rehosting because if you were to rehost, for instance, Amazon Cognito, Active Directory might be something that you need to replatform. Or if you want to refactor altogether and say, I don't want to worry about, uh, if you don't have an identity management platform as it is, I don't want to worry about it. I want my users are users, or I have a requirement for instead of SSO, maybe I have um, federation needs over there. I might just use a refactor altogether 
and say, everyone, you sing a song. Stop trying to log into different components. Refactor, replatform, might make the most sense in some cases. Now, your planning strategy includes migration readiness. Current IT snapshot, you want to discover and organize your data, index it. Right? Index it, clean it up. Figure out what you have, what that's worth migrating. And when we go back to the, uh, the retire portion and retain portion, this helps you determine what you need to make the most cost efficiencies and boosts around your return on investment. So back to your planning strategy right here. Again, the level of effort goes, uh, goes up depending on what you're trying to do. Now, the fastest being uh, retire, retain, relocate, um, or rehost. Relocate and rehost is really the, the same thing, but replatforming um, and lift, tinker, or ship are really uh, more of the middle ground that you're looking for for uh, a rapid return on investment, boots up the ground, and requires less training in some cases than refactoring and replatforming as a whole. Now, when you think about planning timelines, you have to understand that agility is not achieved by itself. The more cloud native you are, means the more retirement or perhaps refactoring that you need to do, uh, the easier it is to project um, faster, uh, faster project durations versus longer year term requirements. As you can see here, that there's an exponential amount of uh, cost and agility that goes with it long term, um, the more you commit to the cloud, the more you commit. And even though the project cost initially might make the most, uh, most hardest degree of effort and most money spent over a longer term of years, you might have better savings and you really have to make that calculation for you. So uh, the less commit, really the less co less commit is really down here in hardware emulation, which is kind of like uh, EC2 type stuff. Uh, you really want to just get away from that and eventually get to a uh, happy middle ground, perhaps doing refactoring uh, por portions of it or perhaps middleware emulation and lift, tinker, and ship might get you a better return on investment within your fiscal year and budget. Now, we talked about discovery, understanding what you have to begin with that's worth migrating. Well, the AWS application discovery tool can do that for you. Once you do that, you can actually understand that, really, where are my applications? What does it belong to? Now, remember that this is not perfect. You still have to put context in there. Not any automated tool can just figure out and say from an agent or agent list space item, hey, this is a server, and I, although I see SAP on it, is it really for your SAP production workloads? It could be for QA or test. You still have to have that uh, consultation. You still have to have that migration intelligence ready to go. Now, ultimately, for AWS application migration service, which is the uh, the successor to Cloud Endure. Cloud Endure was acquired by Amazon Web Services some time ago, and they originally had server migration service. Now they call things an application migration service. Cloud Endure being um, still available and still free, as opposed to application migration service, which charges you money uh, at a standpoint, which is why we show Cloud Endure. It's the same technology underneath. Uh, I just want to give you that, that premise that you can take replication services based on infrastructure on premise and put it directly into an immediate uh, lift and shift. And then you can tinker and rehost later on uh, based on a staging environment. So staging means from a DevOps standpoint, let's stage an environment. It means that I am preparing my, my dependencies and everything that needs to run before I put it in the prod. So you can still lift and shift using Cloud Endure and it replicates your, uh, into EC2 instances as you need potentially the same IP addresses, uh, security groups, and then you can convert, we'll focus on really converting um, and using database migration service, which is called DMS, and then get to a DynamoDB standpoint or RDS standpoint, depending on your use case needs. Cloud Endure can help you do that depending on your license count. But remember that the free licenses are all focused on uh, server migration. So basically uh, on-premise, uh, servers or virtualized on-prem servers to EC2 instances for the most part. And then here, Lyft, Tinker, and Ship, we're focusing on decoupling, creating AMIs, multiple uh, availability zones, something that was harder to achieve on-premise. Now, the AWS Database Migration Service of DMS can help you understand if you're starting with uh, MS SQL, if you have the ability to convert into MySQL, 
you can get RDS done. Now, there are, you have to read into the documentation on what is supported and what's not supported, such as Oracle is supported as a source, but not all forms of it, not all uh, configuration types of it. So uh, MySQL and PostgreSQL are among the easiest forms to migrate because it's a native application task into RDS, which is native um, MySQL and, and PostgreSQL. You, there's also Amazon Aurora, which is um, uh, its, its version of the MySQL or PostgreSQL uh, compatible version, which is higher performance though. So it's actually an RDS um, successor from a standpoint of performance, but not necessarily of architecture itself. Here's what the database migration or DMS service looks like. Again, it's on the console. It has a replication tasks. You can specify uh, different things like the schemas, how to convert the schemas, and it does this great stuff for you. And it'll help you replicate uh, incrementally via tasks uh, to help you get to that lift, tinker, and ship or lift and ship uh, strategy requirements as you need. There's another migration capability, which is extending yourself VMware on Amazon Web Services. So here's the delineation. You have an on-premise structure with vCenter, which is your IT operations people know and love, or maybe your DevOps team already know and loves. And you don't want to learn specifically all the AWS uh, APIs or syntax is needed. You can run services on as an extension on your behalf as if you were just another extension of, of vSphere architecture and you would call upon these services and uh, treat them as if you were just like VMware. So if you need extra storage, you would grab an S3 bucket um, perhaps or EFS or um, something of that nature and you would mount it accordingly saying, I want object storage, um, give it to me and extend it over there and then treat it as such. I don't have to understand anything that's native from a perspective of how to use it, uh, where to use it. I just say, hey, I want an extension here. I want this region. I know what I want. And I can do it from all from my central control of vCenter architecture um, and extend my network, extend my resources, and attach it in a hybrid environment. Uh, very awesome integration. Many places use it. Uh, if it's for you, maybe it's for you. But if the more native you get to AWS in the cloud, the more scaling as well as the uh, cost reduction could be in play um, over a longer period of time. Here's what VMware on AWS looks like. Again, it looks exactly what you do on real life um, on premise, but here we have uh, SDC, uh, a direct connection connector. And then we also have the idea that we have a compute resource pool and we can actually pull in EC2 instances um, and load balancers and other resources accordingly um, into, um, into your, your environment from uh, the AWS architecture itself. Really awesome stuff. Another migration path is offline architecture. Ultimately, the AWS Snow family, there's Snowball, uh, Snowball Edge, and Snowville, which is the primary three. There's also something called um, a Snow Cone, which is a smaller version of Snowball. Snowball was the one of the original ones where you could just like migrate a whole bunch of offline data uh, within a week, uh, maybe sooner. And essentially, you have something mailed to you that resembles a, a NAS drive. They hook it up to your data center and you dump data to it. Uh, Snowball Edge is a little bit different, where you can actually, uh, for instance, if you have AI or machine learning requirements and you need to uh, manipulate in that data as it's in process and it's in transit through the snail mail. Uh, you can do so with uh, certain EC2 computes based on the data. And then that's, that's really interesting stuff. We have computing power manipulating the data as you transport it via snail mail, as opposed to transforming it first and then sending it in a batch to over the wire. Um, these are great solutions if you don't have a fat enough internet pipe or if you're migrating a data center. Speaking of migrating data centers, we have something called AWS Snowmobile. AWS Snowmobile, Snowmobile is at a petabyte schedule. So uh, petabyte, uh, area there's terabytes and there's uh, giga, uh, gigabytes um, as you need. Uh, so you still have terabytes and these snow, uh, snow families for snowball edges and snowball. Small edge means you have compute po possibilities here. Snowball bill is really if you want to hook up a whole data center. And you can even have security that guards that as you migrate across country or something like that. It's pretty interesting. Um, and obviously, you don't want to call Snowball to your house. They probably won't come anyways. But Keep in mind, you have offline means of migrating, uh, not just your architecture and infrastructure as code, but also your data itself, which could take up a lot of time and, and bandwidth on your existing network connectivity pipe. 
So that's it for now. Let's take a quick break and then we'll get to our demo about migration and I'll showcase some of the, the Cloud Endure and uh, what you can do with it. Hey, welcome back. I hope you had a great break. Now, part of your lab will also include creating your Cloud Endure free license. Uh, be sure to follow the instructions in your lab document. But I just want to show you um, just what your console looks like. You can configure it and set up um, using your access key information and whatnot. And of course, you get a certain amount of license. I've already used one for migrating for demonstration purposes. Uh, you set up your programmatic credentials, so you still have to generate uh, static keys in here, so be sure not to lose them. Um, you can create your replication settings at this point. Make sure you have your migration target to the same region you've uh, already been operating in, other type of infrastructure. Um, I would actually change that, unless you had an on-premise requirement, I would change that to um, US East. Um, so it could be destructive. You might have to reinstall the cloud agent. I would say migration service from other infrastructure would just be safe. Um, and then you can choose the defaults here. And utilize what's in your lab environment accordingly. Um, and you can enable volume encryption. You can disable that if you want. And you can tag that uh, for whatever you need. So uh, keep that in mind. But you just need to set up those settings. Now, ultimately, what you need to do also is install the agent to check into the um, cloud-based service um, replication here. So for Windows and Linux machines, you can download these accordingly. And uh, keep in mind that the Cloud Endure has uh, the very specific operating system requirements. You can't just use something like uh, uh, the latest and greatest Ubuntu. You will have to use a certain uh, kernel type. And so it doesn't support 4.9256 or 5.8 or higher. Um, and that's largely because of the, this is part of the Amazonian Web Services acquisition of Cloud Endure. And so they are trying to get everyone to application uh, migration services, which does cost money. This does not cost money. They're trying to get you inside the cloud. But remember that you don't get charged for bringing stuff in. You get charged for keeping it in there. And then, of course, you uh, anything that goes out. So in your PPCs, the, most, uh, the best thing you can do for yourself is go ahead and launch your wizard. Uh, I'll do a simple, single VPC. And I'm just going to um, leave it in there. I'll say VPC source. Uh, sure, same availability zone. I don't really care. Create. Now, this is a lot faster than it was with private sometimes because the net gateways are not pulling in. Um, so I've got a, a new VPC. And I'm going to create an EC2 instance here. I'm just going to show you how, how the setup actually operates, and then you can start the replication process as needed. Um, we'll launch an instance inside a, my newly created VPC. We'll use the free tier only, which is the Amazon 2, Amazon Linux 2 AMI. Uh, we'll use a T2 micro instance. We'll use VPC source, public subnet, and ultimately um, auto sign a public IP. Sure, why not? Uh, we also want to do an IAM role because I want to be able to connect to it and install the stuff without using SSH keys. And let's go ahead and um, add a user data source here. So um, back to here, SSM agent, user um, data source here for user data. And I have this here. Again, we'll copy and paste that. Put that in here. And now remember, you need to have the role already created. So make sure that it's done already from your previous labs. Uh, and let's go ahead and add storage. Uh, no encryption. We're going to use the EBS default if we wish. I don't really care. Uh, no tags, but you should. And uh, because of the new VPC, we'll create a new no, uh, we'll create a VPC security group. Um, we'll say, Go ahead and create a uh, no SSH inbound. We'll remove that. Do a launch, even though it's a public um, instance. Yeah, sure. Key pair. Now it's launching. We've got to wait for that to launch. And we're going to go ahead and sign into that whenever it's ready. We'll say uh, source EC2 instance. Have their name. We'll refresh that. Give it some time there. Close this guy out. And so you'll see my token in here. You can don't use this token, use your own. 
because uh, you'll use up your licenses on mine really quickly. Uh, I will be destroying this account, so this token will change um, at the end of this lecture. We have a running instance already, initializing the T2 micro, which is awesome. And we can connect to it and get to the interwebs fairly quickly. And it looks like I tried a little too soon. So we'll go ahead and give it some time here. Still running checks. Usually you want to wait till two of two is finished. Um, it could take a little bit of time. If you're impatient like me, we'll try this one more time. And it finally attached the instance. Yep, we're in here. And we'll go ahead and ping Google because we know we already have access. Um, and then let's go ahead and um, go ahead and, and grab our migration installation information. So I will use uh, this wget here to grab the, the Linux installer. Now, because uh, you're not uh, admin privileges here because of the user, you have to use sudo in front. Go ahead and grab it in there and then look at it, what it says now. Um, just do what it says in there after you set up your, your replication settings, no prompt. And this is gonna install and uh, do its own little checks. Say you have the kernel headers in there that makes sense and match. And then of course you'll uh, uh, get a, a status. So uh, go and back to setup info. We can see replication settings are coming from um, other infrastructure or a, a uh, um, because this is a VPC in Ohio, uh, we might be okay. So it's successfully finished. It's going to install the agent itself using our token. Project details, get the emails going. And I want to say migration source EC2. Um, maybe that might speed it up. Fine with me. And notice in the other aspects, I've already replicated this once. So you might see events occur here. Uh, you can also go through the event log and see how things have been done over time um, to see what, what's going on. It does take a little while, so just keep that in mind. Um, it is installing this. This does take a little while, and it's going to add it to the to the console accordingly. Um, now it's seeing my other one uh, check in to the machines level here. Uh, I have firewall rules creation failed, and it's telling me I need to copy source and change my blueprint. And how do I solve this? Well, it replication stopped because I don't have a security group. Um, for that. So I'm gonna make sure on demand copy source, create new, uh, private IP, create a new IP and change your role accordingly based on to the, um, the role that makes the most sense. So this will be highlighted in your lab, but I wanted to show you how you can get started. And what you can provision, you don't want an IO one, you kind of want a GP3. So you need to save that blueprint accordingly. Uh, look at your lab and you can launch target machine as soon as this is completed. So most important thing is you need a security group that you apply, which allows the cloud and your settings um, to apply to your to that summit. So we'll uh, create new ones. And bad internet connection, and it's probably because it changed uh, the the I, I changed the, the, the replication setup right here from other infrastructure. So use what's in the lab prospect right here. And we're gonna, you'll need to destroy or uninstall the agent um, accordingly there. So that's how you really get started. Once you get started and get those things up and running, unlike what I did here, which was change that unfortunately, uh, which didn't create the proper security group, you can do a test mode and cutover mode and then watch as it creates a new VPC. So you'll wanna create a target VPC um, inside here. Go to your target VPC, and you'll create two VPCs. You'll want to say your destination is a new one uh, based on your template. So you'll have a source and a destination. So all in all, you'll have your default VPC, a VP source, and a VPC destination uh, that has non-overlapping groups. 
Um, so use the source and destination that makes sense in here. I just want to kind of give you that, uh, that aspect of what it looks like. Create the VPC um, using the wizard or whatever makes sense. And, um, and that way you have your source of your T2 micro right here, and then it hopefully replicates into here using the correct settings accordingly. So I'm gonna go ahead and terminate this. I'll let you do this in your lab. Uh, this will work, just uh, follow the lab instructions. I got a little zealous with that, and it's going to give me some failures until I create a, a proper security group uh, for that. So let me go ahead and terminate my instance here. Don't do this yet. Do it, make sure after you replicate it successfully. And this could take some time, so you want to go ahead and get that started uh, immediately after you've um, done your prerequisite information. So I'm going to terminate that instance, let it, let it shut down by itself. Now, uh, there is no cost of the, keeping the, the public VPCs because it's inter internet gateways don't cost money um, You're in your case. Uh, but I do want to showcase one other thing, though. Serverless Lambda. Now, in the previous um, labs and models, we looked at cross-functional roles. This is account A, which is my XTech systems account. I called it an interesting name for that reason. And let's go back to organizations. I have uh, another account here, which I have a cross-functional role. And I want to assume that role. So I'll go ahead and sign in using an incognito window because I don't want it to drag my other session here. I want to sign into my SCIS account, which is a, a, a B account, the account that I want to access resources in. Let me get my, uh, my soft token here, one second. So um, always using best practices here. Make sure you have MFA on all user accounts whenever possible, as well as the root account. Now I have an uh, S3 service here that is trying that my account A wants to access S3 list S3 buckets, which the SCI security demo bucket uh, created. And that's the goal. So I want to be able to access resources and the B account from the A account using serverless architecture and using roles to be assumed. How do we do that? Well, you will showcase this in a second. Let's go ahead and look at uh, I am role here. And then we have a few roles already created. I went ahead and created the, uh, the cross account S3 lead role. And the S3 read role will actually be the role that is assigned to the, um, to the Lambda on the cross account. Notice I have my trust relationship coming from my account A role, which will execute the Lambda on the account A side. And I'm going to say it requires a, it's my secure string, which is um, if you read up on documentation, there's something called a confused deputy problem. That basically means that if you don't have a secure string, anyone that has a cross account role another account can accidentally let a third party account that has access to it traverse to your account um, with improper roles scoping. So you wanna use a secret value whenever possible and specify that secret value. If you wanted to actually see the, uh, the session uh, assumption policy, here we go, SCS assume role. I only want this principle, which is inside another role on my uh, production, my, uh, my account A and the secure string that I want to use. And obviously you wouldn't use my secure string. Just want to give you that example. And again, you are trying to access S3 services, which is in my case, list buckets or read only of a bucket inside the B account from the A account. Okay, so you don't have to be part of an organization to do this, but um, it is nice to have if you want additional guard role based controls. Let's go back to my IM roles here. Now remember with Lambda, there's something called an execution role and a, uh, a, an actual assumption role of Lambda. So we go to cross account role here, cross account execution Lambda. I'm saying this Lambda needs to execute in my account um, with basic execution permissions to write to CloudWatch logs here. And I also want it to assume a role, which means assume uh, assume the role in the other side, right? This is the read role. That assumption role gives the Lambda 
the definition on what it can do inside that account. That's my destination account. So that's that's a really cool way of doing cross actions uh, accounts for lambdas. And we'll actually see this in a second. Again, I only have to worry about what I want to happen. What does that mean? Well, I don't worry about CPU resources or anything like that. It will scale up based on my needs. And you can actually configure this accordingly. In Lambda, you can say, hey, um, I want my resource and execution summary information. Uh, I can put it in a private VPC if I wish. Uh, and I can also give it uh, code signing, caching, uh, other crazy stuff, as well as um, it, how much memory you want to allocate to it uh, accordingly. And so because I've already set these up here, um, you can also set uh, many different aspects of of your Lambda code here. So I thought that was kind of cool. And of course, you can monitor how it runs uh, based on, on that correction runtime. So I have a sample Python 3 base code here. You can always change and export that Lambda as you wish, but be sure to utilize your boilerplate code in the lab. I'm importing the Boto 3 SDK client, and I'm going to say, in my Lambda handler, use STX to get a client, basically assume a role from STS from within Lambda. I'm going to assume the role on the target account. Um, and notice I'm using the parameters here, which allow me to specify um, the session name as well as the external ID securely. In here, the X key, secret key, and token are based on uh, the assumed role information objects inside from the binary credentials and access key ID. And remember the secret access key. And we saw that in a different module where SES role tokens are in the form of three aspects, access key, secret access key, and session token, which obviously expires based on your, your role, which is by default, how many hours? That's right, one hour. I also want to create a service client to connect to the S3 bucket itself and pull information uh, accordingly, and then only list S3 buckets based on that role. I'm going to create a test payload, which I have already done. If you want to create a test event, you can use any payload as long as it's in JSON format, because we're actually not going to do anything with the event payload. We still have to handle it accordingly. I'm going to assume the role in the target account, which is the B account, and I'm going to get the response of the S3 buckets listed in that account. All right, let's get started. Test. And even though it says test event name with no response, look at the actual logs itself because it's printing standard out. And I get my SEI security demo bucket listed in my target account, right? If I were to do uh, AWS LS inside my my own my own account, this account uh, production A, AWS LS uh, S3 LS. I have uh, Dennis test bucket tonight, which is not inside that account. So that's in my uh, my prod account here uh, in, in account A. Now you can also look at the execution, and I've used uh, quite a bit of memory, and I had a, a milliseconds of two hundred and seventy milliseconds, which I'd be go for for one hundred eighty-eight milliseconds of those. Uh, quite interesting. Going back to CloudTrail, if I really want to see. Um, what my activities look like assuming that role from a security standpoint, or and I can go to event history here. And I've terminated my instances, which is kind of cool. But if I do read only uh, true, describe instances, ls, last instance here. And then if I, you can also find but potentially, uh, what do you want to do here? We could say um, resource type. And we can always say, I don't want EC2, I want S3. And here we go. We've got the creation buckets going on with the user originally. Um, and so you can explore the different resource types here, uh, inside here of how you want to do this. And eventually you'll see the S3 bucket listings in here. So remember that CloudTrail is every API call in. And then of course, if you want to see uh, the execution result, these are in a CloudWatch log um, elsewhere. And you can also utilize this in a monitor format and get the logs directly or the traces from a 
X-ray trace uh, service lens of what APIs we're using the Lambda. Uh, I can use a Lambda Insights as well. Again, this is part of great operational practices to also monitor once you've migrated something into a serverless architecture, monitor what's going on from a service standpoint. Uh, I have no errors in here, nothing to really display, because why? Um, I only ran it really once, so you're not gonna grab really good metrics. And I don't have Lambda Insights on and working yet. So that's another issue. I have to turn it on. I don't want to turn it on. Um, so I'll leave you to explore what you wish. And I hope you had a great lab and experience with using uh, Cloud Endure. And of course, if you want to try out the um, extension of this, there is a challenge portion of this where you can actually use cross roll um, accounts using the best architecture strategies for um, hub and spoke models. Again, we learned quite a bit about migration strategies and the different uh, six R's of it. Uh, Rehost, re uh, and of course this Lambda, if you had this in monolithic code would be a refactor all together to pull serverless. So just a couple of strategies for best practices, up to you what you wanna do based on your organization's needs. Have a great lab and thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next lecture.